Greetings and welcome to another edition of the Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversations, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle, from tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride. Let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshifted.net slash 327, and you can email the show at pedalshift at pedalshifted.net or text me at 202-930-1109 and check Pedal Shift out on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 327th edition of the Pedal Shift Project. My name's Tim Mooney. Thanks so much for joining. On this edition, we're going to be talking history here, a little bit of history, the evolution of bike touring gear from the 1970s to where we sit today. And I use the term bike touring there advisedly because I think we're in the midst of a shift, as many of you have noticed. Many of you who listen to the show wouldn't call yourself a bike tourer, maybe a bike adventurer, maybe a bike packer. You know, lots of different opportunities to label ourselves. And as you all know, although I typically use the term bike touring, I'm not sure if I'm exclusively in that space. So it got me thinking a little bit about what is in the rearview mirror for all of the gear that we use and the history of all of that. I, of course, got started largely in the, oh, we'll call it the early 20 teens. Is that a thing? Is when I I, I really dove into things. But little did I know that a lot of the things that I took as lessons came from well, well before that. And of course, the history of bicycle touring, it goes back really from the beginning of the safety bike when it first came about in the late 1800s. But I think that the modern concept of bicycle touring really evolved out of the bike centennial here in the United States in 1976. And so that's where I want to start. That's not to discount pre-1976. It's not to discount the movements that were very much there in Europe and elsewhere, but that's just my frame of reference. And I think it's a good starting off point here. So let's talk a little bit about bike touring in the 1970s as a start point. And and I'm going to segment this out as bike touring in the 1970s. We're going to talk about the advancements in tech in the 80s and 90s as a second topic. Then we're going to talk about the rise of bike packing in the 2000s. And then we're going to finally talk about modern bike packing gear and trends, how that influences the larger bicycle adventuring movement, and then some thoughts on what might be happening in the future from here on out. So Let's start with the 1970s. Back in the day, by the way, I I was not involved with cycling except as a little kid with a huffy in the 1970s. So I have no frame of reference other than what I've read of all of this. But bike touring in that era was something that really exploded, particularly, as I mentioned, as part of the bike centennial movement. Lots of crazy things happened in 1976 in the United States. If you were not here, either on the planet or in the country in 1976, it was a time of real expansion. There was a lot of things going on because it was the 200th anniversary of the United States of America. And so lots of interesting things happened around that, most notably for purposes of this show bicycle touring. There were a lot of folks that were interested in celebrating the bicentennial of the United States by cycling across it. And that's really where the modern era started. And so long distance bike adventures really grew from that. The organization that is now known as the Adventure Cycling Association was called Bike Centennial, I think back then, or something close to that. And then of course they evolved and continue to this day. The big thing that really influenced that, in addition to just, hey, let's cross America on its birthday, was it it was also a time of the first, I think, time when we were looking at alternative modes of travel here in the United States. We are a very car-centric country. It was grown that way. Post-World War II, of course, there was the interstate highway system that developed, and so many cities, so many localities were built around the notion of you drive places. And of course, the suburbanization of America and all of those other things. Go. There are lots of great urban planning and urbanist podcasts and, and YouTube channels to go learn more about that. But as the mid-1970s and the energy crises that we faced started coming out, alternative transit was something that people really started looking at. And so there was also the notion of freedom and simplicity and, and really the beginning concepts of the modern minimalist movement in a lot of ways have a lot to do with the 1970s. 
So that was the background. That was the the fertile soil where the seed was planted for what became the bicycle touring movement. And what did we have back in the day? Well, we didn't have anywhere near the type of gear that we have right now, but let's talk about some of the things that were available and where people went to for their gear. Let's start with a bicycle. Back then, the materials were very different, but steel was still real back in the day. Steel frame touring bicycles were really the go-to choice for bike touring in the 1970s for the same reason why many of us choose steel today. It's a great material. It's got some good flex. It's sturdy. It can handle long rides. That was what really attracted people back in the day. Frankly, a lot of bikes were made of steel back then anyways. What we saw was, though, some specialization as more and more people asked for bikes that were specifically designed for bicycle touring. So we saw brands like Raleigh and Peugeot and Miata that that made bikes that were adopted for touring, and then they made specifically reliable touring bike brands within their brands. And the the thing that that really helped things out beyond just taking rando bike out was that they started designing them specifically for bicycle touring. Heel strike was the biggest problem for a shorter wheelbase bikes, just a regular old 10 speed. They just slap stuff on. So they ended up making longer wheelbases for that. They also started making relaxed geometry. So you weren't bent all the way down on your drop bars in a more aggressive kind of racing position that so many bikes were built around back then. So they started to give that relaxed geometry that made for more comfortable rides. The longer wheelbases allowed you to put more gear on your bike without hitting those panniers with your heel. That really made for easier riding and the ability to do longer rides. And that really helped people out an awful lot as we advanced through the 1970s. When it came to the gear that was on the bikes, We had the traditional panniers, which of course had been around for decades, if not longer, really as long as as bikes had been around, the safety bike had been around. And so what were those largely made out of? Well, not the greatest stuff. I mean, certainly functional. They were typically made of canvas or nylon, and that was where you put up most of your stuff. And if you ever look at old photos of the 1970s touring, you saw a lot of buckles and straps and a lot of nylon involved. Now, of course, those were perfectly functional for carrying the gear, but they weren't terrifically efficient compared to what we have today. You know, with no compression sacks, nothing along those lines. It was a lot of belt tightening and things along those lines that allowed us to carry things, or I shouldn't say us, allowed people, not me, because I wasn't touring back then. One of the downsides of all of this was, of course, they were heavy compared to what we've got today. They were also attached to racks that were typically solid steel, quite frankly. And overall, the weight that we had to deal with in the 1970s was substantially higher than what we had today but it certainly worked. But there was a lot more reliance on gearing and frankly hopping off the bike from time to time because all of the gear was just a lot heavier. In addition to that, there were some additional limitations. You know, weight was a problem, of course, but The ability to space out the weight was often pretty difficult until we started seeing some panniers on the front wheels, which happened relatively quickly and certainly was around by 1976. The distribution of weight was often dodgy and and you ended up having some stability issues with all of that. And I mentioned before, the gear itself, the racks, everything else, it was just super, super heavy. So that made it difficult to do really big climbs. It made maneuvering more challenging, but it was doable. And I think that people made do with what they had and what was available. And of course, as we all know, bicycle touring exploded. It became a really big deal. Lots of people did it. One thing that I'm I'm not super clear on is whether or not we are in an era where there are fewer or more people doing it. I would have to think because of the availability of gear and whatnot and the popularity of you know podcasts and guides and maps and organizations all around that. I would have to think there are more people now than there were then, but it's unclear to me whether or not that's the case or not. We had some uh, folks who did some bigger tours. The first documented around the world trip happened in the 1970s in this modern era. Of course, we know that there were other around the world adventures that happened far before that. 
Annie Londonderry, I, f- I featured on an early version of this podcast, and, and it's also been a part of a best of. I may have to dig that out again because that best of might actually have fallen out of the feed. So maybe we'll learn about Annie Londonderry again from way back in the day. But Thomas Stevens was the first documented bike trip around the world in the 1970s, and Musto was another person who rode around the world back then. Of course, we had Bike Centennial, and it, there was an increased popularity throughout Europe in the 1970s as part of this entire bicycle touring, bike adventuring movement. And so the gear was what was available with the materials that we had back then. And it worked and it did really well. And then it was popular and then there was money behind it and then the markets got involved. And so what ended up happening in the 1980s and in the 1990s, we had an evolution. And that's a theme I think of all of this is evolution constantly happened. In the 1980s and 90s, we ended up having real technological advancements in a variety of materials that made for better bicycle touring, and I think increased the popularity as a result of all of that. It influenced the gear, it made it more efficient, it made riding more comfortable, and of course, the bicycles improved as well. So let's talk a little bit about some of the material advancements on the cycling. Bike frames and components started to get made out of aluminum and titanium. And one thing that I'll note, I've got, of course, the Green Goblin, which is a bike from the mid-1990s. Unlike any of my other bikes, it is made of aluminum. And it has managed to make it throughout all of this because aluminum, once it fails, it's harder to repair easily. It's it's doable, but it's, it's a little bit harder. But of course, it's a much lighter bike for its frame size compared to one made of steel. Of course, we had titanium starting to come out. And of course, both aluminum and titanium are still around, but titanium has become a much bigger deal. I think in the modern era, we see all sorts of different bikes made out of titanium, including Bromptons and others as well. Of Those are such an improvement over steel in terms of weight. If weight was an issue for you, these new materials made a substantial difference for you. Were they as durable? Open question. I think I, I'm certainly, I ride a lot of steel still, and I think that your mileage may vary, as I often say on all of that. Aluminum really made a big jump in popularity starting in the 1980s. Titanium became a really high-end option. If you think titanium is expensive now, you should have seen it way back in the day. Dollar for dollar, it was super, super expensive. But For folks that were focused on weight, like so many people are when they go from kind of the the racing or the road biking culture into bicycle touring, they still carry that weight notion. And and of course, weight makes a big difference and it, it opens things up a lot more, makes things more accessible for people who aren't as strong riders if they're carrying more less weight compared to the full steel and the nylon bags and the buckles and the straps and things like that. So the materials on the bike side of things really made a difference in the 80s and the 90s. The other thing that came about in the 80s and 90s is something that I don't tend to use a lot of, but many of you do, and that is the rise of clipless pedals. There are folks that swear by clipless pedals, and I do think that they make a difference. I have noticed that when I ride on an indoor trainer, I like them. When I'm out in the real world, I tend to not to like them. Now, I, I'm not using a clipless pedal. I'm using more of a strap. But it's the same idea. It allows you to securely attach your foot or really your shoes to the pedals. Those came about in the late 1980s, and that for many people did a couple of things. Number one, it improved their efficiency. When your foot is squarely on the right part of the pedal, it's going to make you be able to pedal better, get more power in a more efficient way. It also creates more comfort for people, not for me, but for others. I have had issues with them for bicycle touring. In fact, I actually injured my Achilles tendon using them. That's probably more of a me problem than the strap or clipless pedal situation. But in any event, That's where it is. Those really made a big difference for a lot of people in the bicycle touring movement in the in the late 80s and into the 90s and through today. I know many of you swear by clipless pedals and straps and things along those lines. We also saw a huge explosion in camping gear materials. And this I think came about from the transfer from what ultralight backpacking gave to 
backpackers, it ended up transferring and became really, really important for bicycle touring in the 80s and 90s. So we ended up with design improvements in tents, in sleeping bags, and in cooking equipment. So tent materials, they went to more and more lightweight materials like nylon. We shifted away from fiberglass and went to aluminum poles, and then in some cases, titanium poles as well. Overall, tent weight dropped tremendously during this period, but the quality of it really ended up being as good or better than some of the older materials from before them. Sleep kits, sleeping systems, sleeping bags, insulation improvements went through the roof. I have an old bag that my dad used during bike, excuse me, backpacking days. There I go again, bikepacking, backpacking. And it is enormous. It's a great bag. It's a down bag. But what we found was when we went to more modern insulation techniques that went to synthetic down and whatnot, it really improved things from a bang for the buck perspective and from a size and weight perspective. We saw lots of improvements improvements there. Cooking gears, camping stoves, more efficient meal prep, the rise of backpacking meals and freeze-dried technology really, really improved during this period. So what we ended up having was less reliance on heavy types of materials and heavy fuel systems. And all of a sudden, we ended up having really, really ultra-light cooking systems, the stoves, the cooking gear, again, more titanium in that space, more aluminum in that space. And that really, really, really made for a better, more efficient weight to efficacy ratio for all the, all the folks who got involved in bike touring in that era. We also saw, and this is, I think, the probably the one of the more important developments in gear and probably really fast forwarded a lot of folks into the space. And that was the rise of more impressive materials that were waterproof and also breathable at the same time. And of course, Gore-Tex is probably the most famous brand during all of that. It was super expensive when it first came out, but it became widely available during that era. This is about when I start coming into the picture, but more from a hiking and a, I'll call it mountaineering, although my my mountaineering phase was not a very strong one. I think I've told the story. I took a tumble down Mount St. Helens and decided to retire at that point from, my, from any real mount, mountaineering. But I was also into snowshoeing as well. And these types of materials were super, super important because as you all know, I run super hot when I cycle. Can you imagine when I am snowshoeing, I'm running super, super hot. So I have, I, do I, I'm not even sure if I still have the jacket, but an old Nike outdoor gear jacket that was my first kind of breathable but waterproof jacket and what a huge difference that made for me back in those days in the mid late 90s so what happened there it was focused mostly on clothing for hikers and backpackers and whatnot and then all of a sudden we started seeing those materials moving over towards bicycle touring gear so we ended up getting more waterproof panniers and cycling apparel so what that ended up doing is again it just made for more comfort expansion of the ability to ride through maybe less serious storms and it just made for better, better cycling during that entire period. I think that if, of all of the innovations that we had throughout the years, this is probably one of the more important ones that we had. So we ended up going away from just Gore-Tex and there were other brands that came out, breathable, moisture wicking fabrics. We saw the rise of more efficient types of wools, wool materials that weren't as scratchy. The rise of merino wool, I think, came during this period as well. So a lot more technical fabrics that were breathable, wickable, that also was a huge development during this period. And that, of course, ended up going more into other types of athletic endeavors as well. You know, runners started using it and it all sort of fed upon each other as there would be advancements in one particular area of athletic achievement. It actually ended up improving for the bicycle touring space as well. Huge, huge, important stuff. And that really got us through the 90s and into the 2000s. And that's when we first started seeing the rise of bike packing. Now, I would say that bike packing probably didn't really start coming out in its more modern era, probably until the 2010s. But I think that the influence of all of this started in the early 2000s as well. 
And this was a really important influence because I think it's what's created the true evolution away from the traditional like touring setup of panniers, especially the four pannier setup, into more compact setups there. Bike packing, and you know me, I'm I think that there's all sorts of different de- different definitions for all of this, but it's self-supported, just like bike touring. It's off-road more typically, although we're starting to see people describe what has traditionally been called bike touring. They're now calling that bike packing. I think we're starting to see an evolution of maybe the term bike packing becoming the maybe umbrella term here, even for on-road bicycle adventuring. But I think traditionally, and I think for those of you who would consider yourself bikepacking purists, they tend to be more off-road, more trail, more gravel, things like that. It has an emphasis more on lightweight gear and the ability to go places that a traditional bike touring setup absolutely can't, more rugged terrain, more backcountry kind of stuff. One thing that I think that it's really important to see the distinction is we're starting to see the evolution away from racks. Although we're seeing hybrid setups, kind of like what I ride on, where I have a rack, but I'm also focusing in on some of the better parts of bike packing, and that's going to be things like frame bags, seat packs, handlebar rolls. Now, I tend to focus more on frame bags rather than the other two, but the the rise of seat packs and handlebar handlebar rolls really has created a real evolution in how we get out there and ride. So the, why do we do this? Why, why did we go in that direction? Well, for folks who really wanted to get away and get off on the pathless pedal, shall we say? Ha ha. Hi, Russ. They are Focus more on making sure that the weight distribution and stability is prioritized. And that means that what we've got to do is we've got to move our gear away from the outside of the bike and more into the inside of the bike within the frame itself. So in the main triangle of the bike, we've got frame frame backs, seat packs that end up going on the saddle. So they're within the, the, the line of where all the weight distribution is. It's right behind your rear essentially. So that really helps with stability. Handlebar rolls, again, they're in that main line where your body weight is centered. So we have much more stability there. And when you've got all of that together, yes, you have less capacity, but you have a much more balanced load. You have less of a profile, so you're really cutting through wind. You're able to get through on single track much, much easier than you would if you have a couple of big panniers that are sticking out of the side of your bike. The balance in the load allows you to ride a little bit more aggressively and a little bit more safely on these types of services. So it really, really makes a difference. But oh, by the way, it's equally good when you're out on pavement or when you're on a wider trail like the C&O or something along those lines. There there are a lot of great arguments for using that bikepacking specific gear outside of the concept of just this backcountry single track kind of thing where it was really developed for. So we're starting to see more of that. That. The efficiency of these types of systems have ended up expanding. And I think now when I'm talking to younger riders, that's where they tend to be focused in on a lot. The influence of mountain biking and gravel riding that really rose out of this period had a lot of influence on this type of gear as well. And of course, you know, I've talked about uh, why we're doing all of that and how we're getting in that geometry. We're getting it into our our ride line a little bit more. We've had further influence of, of materials as well, more lightweight gear, more durable gear that can handle getting smacked around on a trail. And we've also gotten into a much better realm of waterproofing. It's gotten even better. We've gotten bike backpacking technology has gotten even better, much more lightweight. All of this is transferred into the bike packing kind of setup. And we're starting to see so much of that influence even now to the modern day, which I'm going to get to in a few minutes here. And I mentioned this before, the advantages to this era, of course, we get more balance of weight distribution. The gear is in the frame rather than on racks. We're removing racks, so we're reducing the weight even more there. We have better handling. We have better stability, especially on more challenging terrain, so we can go places that we couldn't go before. And because it's more compact and because it's lighter, we're able to ride in a more comfortable way. 
even if we're on roads and trails. So bikepacking gear has really improved things. It's also changed, I think, a lot of the style of bicycles that we've used. Sometimes there's been a lot of focus on drop bars and things along those lines. Of course, we've seen the move towards a more upright riding for a lot of the bikepacking types of setups there. Although, of course, more aggressive kind of drop bars still certainly exist even in this space. The downside, of course, the the, the trade-off that you have, you're not allowed, maybe allowed is the wrong word, you're not able to carry nearly as much gear. But because we've gotten into more efficiencies with the materials that make up our gear, well, it's, it doesn't matter. We've shrunk the gear down so much that we've made up for all of that. So if you're a kind of a kitchen sink kind of bike tourer, maybe you're not going to be able to do that with modern bike packing gear. But because a lot of the gear that we have, the sleeping bags, sleeping pads, things along those lines have really gotten much better. The rise in the importance of inflatable mattresses and things like that, that's really, really improved our ability to have a comfortable camp night. And of course, I think that folks that do bikepacking end up having maybe a little bit less in terms of what they need and want when they come to camp. So it all ends up balancing out. And again, it's ride your ride. You know, what are the types of experiences do you want when you need? And that's going to determine the type of gear that you carry. So what's happening today, more today? Well, we're starting to see even more advancements in material technology, and we may be entering in another important phase. I talked about how the rise of Gore-Tex and waterproofing was really important. Now, when we're starting to get into materials like Dyneema, fiber, and other similar types of new materials, things are just getting lighter and lighter and lighter, and we're getting really exceptional strength to weight ratios. So we're not having to sacrifice our durability while making our gear lighter. If any of you ever had any kind of ultralight backpacking gear, you notice that sometimes it would fail really quickly because the materials were really lightweight and nice, but they would tear very easily. Well, now that we're starting to get these amazing new materials, we're starting to get to the point where it's sort of like they just make stuff ultralight now because it's just as strong and it's just as valuable. And it, it, it's really fantastic, both in the backpacking perspective, but now, of course, that's all translating into the bike packing and bike touring space. We're also seeing a real rise in technology, another game changer. If you're a paper map person, I salute you, but I am not a paper map person. I really like the fact that technology has made a lot of the type of working that we do a lot easier, but of course that's translated to adventuring on our bicycles as well. GPS navigation, our cell phones apps specifically for bike packing and bike touring they have been a huge game changer knowing where you are at any point on your route is a real improvement i think over trying to figure out where you are on a map uh, I, it's made peace of mind for me a lot easier it allows me to just go out and ride without having to stress so much without having to plan so much as well at least for me i know there are many of you who are back in the paper map days were just sort of like forget it. Let's. I'll just keep going. And when I come to a landmark, I'll know where I am then. I think technology is good for me, at least on all of that. We're also seeing a huge improvement because of the technology. We've seen major improvements in battery technology. If you recall, if you listen back to the show in the early days, I was really focused on trying to generate electricity while I was on tour, solar panels and, and dynamos and things like that. I really was focused on dynamo electrical generation. And I've really given all of that up because I can carry so much battery capacity in such a light package now that, you know, dealing with the extra moving parts of a dynamo generation setup, it's just not worth it to me. But that exists too. And for those of you who are on real expedition tours, that's a really important thing. Solar charging has become much, much better through the years. It's still got a little ways to go, I think, but it's gotten excellent and better. We're also starting to see those extended trips being benefited by all of this. You know, GPS, as I mentioned before, cell phones, all of that kind of stuff is getting really, really important. We're starting to see watch technology grow. We're starting to see rescue technology with some of the types of, of you know, backcountry types of assisted devices. I've been telling the story of my buddy MJ, who took a terrible fall in the backcountry in Canada and was able to hit his spot button and was literally rescued by helicopter. Kind of amazing. It's it's out there and 
I don't know what they did in the 1970s. Well, now we're able to feel a little bit safer with those types of things. Maybe it could have been a bad ending to a story back in the day. But now with this, this integration of new technology into our trips, we've got a lot more safety involved with what we've got. The tech you know, has also improved in materials. As I mentioned before, I think the moisture wicking materials have gotten much better and much cheaper. Quick drying fabrics, specialized shoes, clipless or otherwise, rugged materials for protection for those who are wearing helmets when they're out in the backcountry. Those have gotten lighter and better and they breathe better. They've got better technology all integrated into all of this carbon fiber and dyneema and all of that. That's really, really, really improved things for bikepacking in particular, but also with all forms of bicycle adventuring. We're also seeing kind of the emergence of more ways to do this kind of stuff. And, and you know, I've been talking about gear, but I, I think that, that what that has done is it's really influenced the types of adventures that we go on. Of course, we talked about bikepacking, but we're also starting to see racing get influenced as well. So there's a growing popularity of ultra distance bikepacking races. We see the tour divide. We see right across America. And of course, they're in a variety of different spaces as well. Gear has influenced all of that in a major way. Comfort, performance, going lightweight. A lot of these things wouldn't be quite as possible. And certainly we couldn't get the performance we get out of those types of races without all of these trends and all of the technological influence on uh, the gear that we have, the bikes that we ride, things like that. All right, so that's been about a half hour of the evolution of things from the 1970s until now. What do I think is going to be happening in the future? Well, it's really hard to tell. I feel like that we're in the middle of a big movement right now, and that's these ultra light materials and the material technologies that are continuing to improve. I think there's a couple of places where I think we're going to see. We're going to see that evolution into the bike, more bike packing and away maybe from traditional bike touring setups with the panniers. I don't think that's ever going to go away because I think for a lot of people, me included, Riding with panniers is a, there's a comfort level with all of that. I can carry a lot of stuff. I already have them. So it, it it's the thing that I have. So I'm going to continue to ride my ride that way. But I think that we're going to see evolution both in name and in substance for new people getting involved into bike packing. I just think that it's a more evolved space. Is it going to be for everyone? No, not, not at all. I mean, I think Ortlieb's going to be around forever and they're going to make panniers forever. But I do think that they even they recognize that bike packing gear and frame bags and things like that are an important addition to, if not replacement for traditional pannier bike touring. So I think that's I think what we end up with is maybe more of a hybrid. I think that you know calling this a bicycle touring podcast, I've said this before, may be a bit of a misnomer because I'm evolving along with the rest of I guess the movements too. I, I think that what I ride right now is certainly a hybrid model. I, I love the the frame bags. I've gotten away from handlebar bags, and you know my my, my bikes do di- different things for for different rides, and and you know I go into that for all of the different tour journals that I talk about. It should be mentioned that with the improvement in battery technology and the constant iteration with e-bikes, that may be a major, major evolution when we get even better in both battery and material technology for them. I'm excited for the fact that as I start to age out of a traditional cycling setup, having ridden e-bikes, I can totally see my ability to continue touring in maybe 20 years or so is certainly going to have a, a great chance to be aided by e-bikes. Maybe sooner than that, maybe 10 years. I don't know. It's just going to depend on what ends up happening with that technology. But that's what I've got my eye on for the future as it becomes easier and better to charge up these batteries that have higher capacities and quicker charge times and the ability to charge them in more remote locations. I think it's going to be something really interesting to see with an eye on all of that. So that's where we are today in 2023. I hope this was as interesting for you as it was as interesting for me to research. I think that we've come a long way, but really when I look back, ultimately what we do now in 2023 is not a whole heck of a lot evolved 
away from what folks did back in 1976. We're still strapping stuff to our bikes and we're still pedaling. You know, the materials are different. What we bring along is going to be a little bit different. It's a little bit lighter. It's a little more efficient. But ultimately, we're still pedaling with stuff on our bikes and sleeping in weird places. And in that way, there's quite a through line from 1976 all the way to 2023. And as always, we like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community. Expanding into live shows and covering new tours, if you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot and annual options. If you're not into the small monthly thing, check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society. On to the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lean, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Didis, Thomas Skadow, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Telgatis, Chris Barron, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Mr. T, Nathan Poulton, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Joseph Quinn, Drew Porter, Byron Patterson, Joachim Robber, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Hankel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Avilas Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Jody Zoranen, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, Brian Bechtal, Reinhardt Bigel, Greg Middlemas, Connie Moore, William Gothman, Brian Benton, Joan Churchill, Mike Bender, Rick Weinberg, Billy Crafton, Gary Matushak, Greg Latois Lopez, James Sloan, Jonathan Dillard, John Funk, Ronald Paroli, Dave Roll, Brian Hafner, Misha LeBlanc, Ari Messenger, David Kropke, Todd Grossbeck, Wally Estrella, Sue Reinert, John Lico, Stephen Granada, Philip Mueller, Robert Lackey, Dominic Carroll, Jackie McCullough, John Hickman, Carl Presso, David Neves, Patty Louise, Terry Fitzgerald, Peter Steinmetz, Timothy Fitzpatrick, Michael Azuski, Hank O'Donnell, David Zanoni, David Weil, Matthew Sponsum, Chad Reno, Spartan Dale, Carolyn Ferguson, Peggy Littlefield, Lauren Allen Smith, Eric Burns, Thomas Pearl, Darren McKibben, Richard Stewart, Dave Fletcher, Jack Smith, Luke Parkinson, Ryan Patterson, Sarus Faravar, John Gardner, Sam Scruggs, Dwight Pintinger, Connie Bowder, Rob Merrifeld, and thanks to all past and anonymous folks for helping make this show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available.